Good morning, everybody. Is there anybody here who does not understand English? I love how nobody ever raises their hand to that question. So, I'm Rick Falkvinge. I'm uh, Falkvinge on Twitter. I love seeing my name on Twitter. Whenever I say something brilliant, something really stupid, doesn't matter, I love seeing my name on Twitter. So feel free to quote me, especially if I say something stupid. People love seeing that for some reason. So a brief introduction of me. I founded a new political party, the Swedish Fire Party, five, year, five years ago. I uh, managed to put two people into the European Parliament by becoming the biggest party in the sub-30 demographic. And we did that on less than 1% of our competition's budget using new swarm methodologies, which use less than, uh, which are extremely cost efficient, and that can be used by any large scale organization. Well, almost any. And there's a whole book on that called Swarmwise, which you can download for free, which is not the topic of this talk. But <coughs> That gave me a number of awards. Some uh, foreign policy magazine called me a top 100 global thinker. Uh, I was nominated to one of the 100 most influential people by Time magazine and so on and so forth. So today's entertainment. <coughs> I'm going to talk about challenges for Bitcoin in uh, particular and cryptocurrency in general and what we can learn from the file sharing conflict that has played out over the, over the past 30 years. And I'm going to come back to five important lessons that we need to bring with us in order to make this a technology for the future, a money for the future. So let's start by looking at the 1980s. This was what a, music player looked like then. And I'd like to particularly call your attention to the fact that there are two decks for cassettes in the middle part of this. There are two decks. And in the very middle of this picture is a button labeled thus. Friends would bring empty cassettes to friends and they would pop the empty into the cassette deck of a friend, put, put something else in, and press the button copy. Because despite the insistent, or the insistent assertions of the copyright industry, copying was legal in the 1980s. Copying was legal. And I'd like to make the thought experiment here. Copying was more than legal. It was expected. You, could, you were expected to share with friends. You were expected that your, your friend would have this copy button. That means also, from a marketing perspective, it was more than expected. It was mandatory. It was required. So it was Ill made illegal gradually during the 1990s, just before Napster, in, one of the, in yet another one of the copyright industry's tantrums. They fir gradually fir first said that they demanded compensation for the fact that people were copying outside of their distribution monopoly. So they got a tax on these empty tapes. And then they made that copying between friends illegal, but kept the tax on the tapes. And then they expanded the tax on the tapes to also include hard drives, memory, memory tapes, uh, memory cards, DVDs, hard drives, games consoles, and some other things. They do throw these tantrums at irregular intervals, you know, as in the sky is falling about every five to ten years. Just looking at the past century, we, we started with 1905, where the self-playing piano and the gramophone would be, quote, the end of a vivid songful humanity, end quote. Broadcast radio was the uh, end of record sales that plummeted from $75 million to just $5 million in 1979. That happened to coincide with the Great Depression, but it was still broadcast radio's fault. Loudspeakers, when, when audio-visual works came, when movies with sound came out, 
television, who would possibly go pay to see a movie when you could see it for free at home? That was totally unfair competition. One decade later, cable television, who could possibly compete with, free, compete with paid television when you had to give it away for free? Paid television must be outlawed. The, the exact opposite argument, just a decade later. And so on and so forth. Here's page two. So this has gone on for a while. But sites like the Pirate Bay were legal in the 1980s. And the thought experiment here is, what if they had still been legal? What if we had, we had still innovated around the concept of helping people share what they liked? That copy button. What if that copy button had still been mandatory from a marketing perspective. Because the reason it isn't is because a legacy industry didn't like it and prevented its continuing on to a new to a new technology. They prevented the shift to digital. They prevented something analog equivalent to move on to digital. And this is the key here for my entire presentation that I'll come back to. How much innovation has been lost? Let's take a look at some previous episodes of this. Let's take a look at what happened in the 1500s. And I'll focus on the Catholic Church. At this time, books were copied laboriously by hand, by monks. The cost of just one book was astronomical, and they were all written in Latin. This was important that they were all written in Latin, because that gave somebody the power of interpretation. The power of interpretation. The, it gave somebody who understood Latin the ability to tell what was in the book. And since the book was an instruction manual, the Bible at this point, whoever was able to s say what was in the book had the ability to dictate reality to those who did not understand Latin. They had the ability to tell true from false. And that is the greatest ability you could ever have. And then came the printing press. They had an information advantage. Then came the printing press, 1453. And with it came a Bible in German, the Gutenberg Bible followed by Bibles and local languages all over Europe, which obviously immediately led to 200 years of bloody war all, all across the continent. And here's where we back up a minute and say, what? The book's language led to 200 years of war? But think here. It was written in Latin. It was written in Latin, right? So publishing it in local languages meant something. It meant that people could read the book themselves. The power of interpretation had been lost. The power of interpretation had been lost. And that power of interpretation was more than just a power of interpretation. It was a gatekeeper position. It was a gatekeeper position over all the world's knowledge and culture. So these previous gatekeepers, how did they react? They like not being gatekeepers anymore? No, they didn't. They wanted the, this copying to be harshly punished, all wh wherever it appeared. The printing press was an evil technology because it allowed bad ideas to spread. And so copying, sharing, printing was increasingly punished. Harsher and harsher. OK. Harsher and harsher punishments until, what? Yeah, obviously. Until on January 13, 1535, it hit the death penalty by hanging for using a printing press. Yes, you heard that right. Unauthorized copying has been punished by the death penalty. And guess what? It didn't help either. Not even the death penalty deterred people from sharing and copying. 
Now, enter this guy, Martin Luther. Not Martin Luther King, he came later. This is Martin Luther. <laughs> he made his 95 theses to the church wall, where we've learned in history books that he protested that the Catholic Church was selling salvation. But if we abstract this a little bit, he was doing more than that. He was protesting the information advantage. He was protesting the power of interpretation that they used to be able to sell salvation. The reason they could do that was because they had the power of interpretation, because they had the gatekeeper position. So what he did was to protest the gatekeeper position, which made his team one in these two, 200 years of war. But they were far, far better at exploiting the new technology. They were printing discussions, disseminating ideas, and using the new technology to their advantage. So how did the old side react? Well, they attacked the technology and the use of it. They couldn't possibly comprehend not being the gatekeepers. They saw themselves as responsible rather than blocking. They saw it as their responsibility to see what was available to the uneducated masses and couldn't cope with having educated masses. So they attacked the use of the technology and its users. Rather than defending their ideas, they attacked the technology that allowed others to challenge their ideas. And they did so in defending a gatekeeper position over knowledge and culture. Does this scenario from 500 years ago sound familiar? It should. It should. It's played out a number of times since then. And it's playing out right now with the internet all over again. This is how corruption typically works. You have a legacy player that see that it mistakes its privilege for a responsibility. Mistakes its privilege for a responsibility. And argues that it should keep exercising this responsibility. So let's move ahead a bit to the 1800s. Look at another one of these examples to understand what's coming next in the cryptocurrency wars. And we're going to look at red flags. Red flags. This was at the dawn of the automobile, although it wasn't called the automobile, it was called something more that people could relate to. And unfortunately, as I think we, we've all learned, new things tend to scare people. And lawmakers can exploit this especially legacy industries tend to exploit this. So how many here have heard of the Red Flag Act in the UK of 1865? A few, okay. So what this law said was that every car, automobile, must have a crew of three people. It must have a driver, steering wheel, makes sense, we still have a driver, a stoker, essentially a machinist, and a man walking in front of the vehicle waving a red flag. Here's a contemporary drawing. This was from 1850, so I think it's just out of copyright. You'll observe that what this does is limit the utility of the car to walking speed. Since somebody must walk in front of the car, the car can't drive faster than somebody walking, which limits the utility of this new invention to slowly, but safely, transporting goods, and goods cargo and people to the stagecoach and railroad stations. Guess who lobbied for the Red Flag Act? Ding, 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 we have a winner. Railroad and stagecoach industries were the lobbyists for this. 
And this is the typical pattern, that the legacy players are pretending to embrace the new technology. We love this new technology. It's great for bringing people to our stations. But the laws they're lobbying for are choking it to prevent the new technology replacing the legacy players. The laws they are lobbying for are choking the new technology. You can see this very clearly with the internet right now, how legacy communication players are trying to not make it disrupt them with net neutrality and similar. So when this kind of mass psychosis sets in that the Red Flag Act is actually a good idea, you can see the same thing with the copyright monopoly, with various kinds of, of patent monopolies and other, uh, other basically bad laws that go just insane when you do more of them that once somebody decides that this is a good idea, people will copy it and think doing more of it is a better idea. And my favorite example is from Pennsylvania, where the, copyright, where the copycat Red Flag Act required any driver who saw animals up ahead on the road to immediately take three actions. They were required to A, immediately stop the vehicle, B, immediately disassemble the vehicle <laughs> and C, hide all the parts in nearby vegetation. The bill passed unanimously. When mass psychosis sets in, common sense does not apply. Common sense does not apply. When a legacy player makes legislators think that something is a good idea, common sense is completely out the window. Don't think you're safe because Bitcoin is a good idea. It's not. Or rather, you're not safe. Bitcoin is a good idea. So, we are seeing the same pattern from the copyright industry today. We're seeing the same pattern from some leg legacy communications players today. And we have some lessons here. We have some lessons here. The financial legacy industry can be expected to play the exact same tricks. Follow this pattern to the blueprint, step by step. I don't want to stand here in 20 years expla explaining to teenagers that holding Bitcoin was once legal. I'd wa I want us to learn from the mistakes we made in the file sharing wars, in the file sharing conflict. We had a copy button on every music player. It's gone now. We have Bitcoin today. I don't want it to be gone in 20 years. And if you're looking at the copyright industry's tantrums, and their payoff, and comparing it to the financial industry. I mean, the copyright industry got a tax on blank tapes. The financial industry got a bailout of $800 billion plus another $16.1 trillion, and that's just in the US. They have a habit of giving, getting very good return on investments when they, when they throw tantrums. So, Five key lessons. Five key lessons. First, the legacy players are going to throw all the bullshit they can at legislators. They're going to require a say in who gets to trade, who gets to do business, and who doesn't get to do business. They are going to require a say in who gets to trade, who, gets, who doesn't get to trade, who gets to use cryptocurrency, who doesn't get to use cryptocurrency. Don't fall for that. The instant they get a say in if their replacement can do business, 
that say will always be, now sorry, you can't replace us. Of course it will. And they will assert this over and over and over and over again, increasingly aggressively. It's, I cannot overstate the importance of not trying to placate them by giving in just a little. Because th if they get some ground in such a debate, they will never give up that ground. And they will not be satisfied un until they can completely kill their replacement. That's not how a market economy works. In a market economy, we have a free competition. If somebody is stale or obsolete, they are allowed to go out of business. You don't let them set rules to outlaw their replacement. This also goes, this doesn't just go for outlawing the business owners. As we've seen, legacy players will also attack the end users of new technology. They will not just attack the businesses, but also the customers of those businesses. Second, you don't owe them anything. They will, legacy players will talk about fair competition, about how new players should play by the rules. They will whip up any attempt at moral high ground. You owe them nothing. Any entrepreneur must always compete on their own merits. Legacy players don't get to set the rules for disruptors. And it's important to notice here that the copyright industry has been successful in regulating what internet companies can and cannot do completely despite this general rule, which is a complete failure of the internet sector in allowing themselves to be bullied like that. They will present a narrative in mainstream press about how it's unfair, how, it's, how they are being bullied, how people are being criminal when they're not playing by their rules. This might, must be countered and forcefully so. And it needs to be countered in the same press. It needs to be countered in their own, in today's legacy financial press. Remember that the technology, uh, technology sector has had its own press for pretty much decades. What was written there but was not noticed at all by legislators or by those who set the rules for new technology, for the internet. So we have some very good cryptocurrency news outlets today, but they are not enough. This needs to be played out in the field of the legacy players and they need to be countered on their home field when they try to assert a moral superiority or a business superiority. It should be fairly easy because they are in the financial world, they are in the business world. If you can point out that my business is superior to yours, it should be an easy deal. Don't expect it to be. Lesson four, look credible. When Napster hit, us tech geeks were in our teens. Nobody would listen to a teen whose face was full of acne. Today, we're fairly successful middle-aged entrepreneurs standing with some weight on our feet. So it's easier to get to the right ears. It's easier to look credible to the people you need to look credible to. But that doesn't necessarily mean you have their ears. Who in here knows what it takes to look credible to, to a financial regulator? I don't. I do know what it, need, what it takes to look credible to venture capitalists or business investors or, or management executive circles, that kind of people. Financial regulators? I'm sorry, but that's new territory to me. And I think it is to a, lot of, to a lot of us who are going from technology into finance. Last but not least, and this is where we're coming full circle, assert 
analog equivalent rights. That copy button did not survive the jump to digital. We need to assert that whatever we can do in the analog world, we should be able to also do in the digital world, such as sending anything to anybody. The letter in the analog world had four characteristics to it. It was anonymous, it was untracked in transit, it was never opened in transit to see what it contained, and the mailman was never responsible for the contents of the message. That was the letter you put in the mailbox. All these four characteristics have been lost in the transition to digital. And I have to say that that is one of the greatest failures of our generation, that our children do not have the same civil liberties as our parents had, because they have been lost in the transition from analog to digital. And if that letter had survived, file sharing would be completely legal because I assert that we had the right to send anything to anybody once. We should still have that right, even if we're doing it via a different media. And if, somebody, if that means somebody can't make money, I don't care because entrepreneurs don't get to regulate civil liberties depending on their profit. We do it the other way around. If somebody can't make money in the face of sustained civil liberties, they get to do something else or go out of business. So with cash, with what, what is the analog equivalent rights for cryptocurrency? We're carrying cash today. There are a lot of things that will be challenged that we don't even think of today. The right to carry cash, the right to trade without permission, the right to trade for cash at all, the right to have cash at home without telling anybody, the right to have a certain amount of cash at home without telling anybody, the right to transfer cash, the right to give people money, things that we take for granted today. We can expect all of these to be challenged, eroded, and possibly even failed if we don't safeguard them today. Just like we lost all the rights of the sealed letter in the transition to digital, along with that copy button. So the five key lessons. Don't accept regulations from a legacy industry trying to prevent their replacement. Any business must stand on its own legs and replacements owe obsolete players absolutely nothing. Counter the narrative. Look sharp. And assert analog equivalent rights. We can expect, if you thought the copyright industry was bad, you've seen nothing compared to what the financial industry can put up when they want something. Cryptocurrency is a great invention. It is absolutely awesome. And don't, don't let this get outlawed. Don't, th don't let this get choked. Don't let this get a number of stupid red flag acts all over it that get copied like crazy in, a, in one of these mass psychoses. My key lesson here, learn from our past mistakes learn from our past mistakes. And that's 30 minutes exactly. Thank you very much. All right. And the good news is we have 15 minutes uh, left for questions. So um, my brother has a microphone over there, so we'll cover the left side. So before you ask the question, uh, wait for the mic. Otherwise, you have to repeat it. So we've got a question for. Rick. Okay, good. Hello, best. Uh, hello, Rick. Uh, I have a question. Uh, currently, the legislation is uh, is coming from the United States to Europe. Um, uh, I'm sorry. Can you speak up a little? It works, but should. Uh, the legislation is coming from the United States to Europe uh, about uh, the cryptocurrency. 
what would you, what would be a wise idea uh, how to uh, how to fight it actually uh, if it becomes too uh, too hard in Europe to handle it? Uh, uh, how do you f so? How do you fight legislation coming out of the U.S. when you're based in Europe? There are many ways to do that. Uh, knowing the geopolitical game, one of the advantages of Europe is that we're the world's largest economy, and that doesn't come lightly. Another advantage of being in Europe is that a lot of regulation is at the national level here, whereas it's at the federal level in the United States. That means that. One country in Europe can change its national laws and be protected from fr trade sanctions from the United States by means of being part of the European Union. Because the US cannot apply trade sanctions against the European Union since, again, it's a larger economy. It can apply trade sanctions against Cuba because Cuba is a much smaller economy, but Cuba couldn't apply trade sanctions against the US. So how do you apply how, how do you change the future, essentially, from here based in Europe? We're in the world's largest economy. Don't underestimate that. What we don't have to do what other people say. Okay. Next question. Any questions for Rick? There's one over here. Um, I really liked your presentation, but my question would actually be for the previous speaker. How okay. does he want to react on this? Well, what exactly do you want me to respond to? Do you recognize yourself in the picture uh, painted here from the legacy financing sector? Well, I think I gave you my, uh, my view on cryptocurrency during my presentation. I think that Bitcoin has its limitations and cryptocurrency in principle has a future. And of course, um, it's a potential competitor for us. So we look at it with interest. But I don't see that uh, we are lobbying very frantically against it at the moment, no. I mean, I do see that regulators worldwide uh, are looking into Bitcoin and are, um, for example, are worried about the fact that it's being used for illegal activities. So I do see the point of applying some of the limits and controls. Well, you... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, if you want, let me finish. I mean, some of the limits that are imposed on, um, on the cash and the currencies, electronic currency that we currently have, I think is there a good reason. So I do understand the drive of regulators to at least investigate whether it's possible to impose those limits on Bitcoin as well. But I do agree here that it would be a pity if such a nice innovation would get lost because it would be stifled um, by too much limitations. I think we should just... Uh Last questions for Tony's and then we Tony's will be here the, the whole day, so we need to focus now on the question. Hey, just a quick, uh, just a quick comment on that, if you'll allow, sir. Uh, I agree that Bitcoin is used sometimes used for illegal activity, unlike, for example, the U.S. dollar. Yeah. <laughs> What's the next mistake waiting to happen uh, when you, uh, uh, you, you uh, uh, wanted us to learn from the lessons? I'm here. Uh, what's the mis next mistake we're going to make? What's the next red flag we're going to wave in front of our financial institutions? I think that's an excellent question. And it's, there are a number of mistakes we can do at this point. One of them is underestimating just how much is happening in the background. Remember that the copyright industry outlawed mass copying before Napster hit. It outlawed mass copying before it went mainstream. Bitcoin has not gone mainstream yet. What is happening in the background right now? As a project manager, as, a, as an entrepreneur, you don't need to fear all the world's horrors before you. What you should fear is the dark. 
Thank you very much. Oh, one question in the back. Um, Mr. Favring, um, thank you for your presentation. Um, I see you speak with a lot of passion. I'm here in the back. I see you speak with a lot of passion about uh, organizing resistance. But um, the feeling I always get with presentations like this is how on earth are you going to move uh, the masses uh, to accept this? Because these people who are here paid 30 euros or more to get here are a very interested uh, piece of work. But uh, how do you reach the people sitting in front of a television and just wanting to have their happy lives in the slave plantation? That's, that's my biggest question. Excellent question. I think you answered part of it. Um, people who just want to sit in front of the television want a cheap television, don't they? And with credit card fees being between 3 and 5 percent, somewhere in, in that range, if you could ask a merchant if they could cut away all the credit card fees, that would mean that a typical electronics retailer would double their profit margin. The mar margins are super, super thin in that segment. Three to four, uh, three, five, four, three, four, five percent. If you could cut away three to five percent on every transaction, you would double your profit margin. So there's an enormous incentive for big retailers here to go to start accepting Bitcoin as a payment. And once they start that, they could offer rebates to people who pay with Bitcoin. So people are starting to get their television sets for 5% off if they pay with Bitcoin. That pressure will eventually press down the price point to push people who accept credit cards out of business entirely. So you have a very, very strong commercial incentive to push this. This is not just ideological. This is not just technical. There are very strong commercial incentives to make this succeed and get rid of the credit card middlemen. However, it's nowhere near usable enough yet. A, a disruptive technology typically takes 10 years from conception to hitting mainstream usability recipe. It took 10 years from blogging to, to go to TypePad and WordPress. It took 10 years from uh, streaming video to, have, to go from cheap porn sites to hit YouTube in 2005. It took 10 years from file sharing to use Z modem in the early, early 80s to hit early 90s to hit Napster around the turn of the century. So ex expect somebody to hit the right recipe in 2019, 2020 for a mainstream breakthrough. And that's going to be the YouTube birth moment. That's when mainstream t starts taking off. That's not when it has taken off. So we're not there yet, but there are, there are very, very strong commercial mechanisms and incentives for this to happen. Not to mention all the thousands of geeks who are heavily invested and want this to, su to succeed. Don't underestimate them. Well, thank you very much for uh, your presentation. Uh, I really liked uh, how you uh, warned us not to give them an inch, uh, not to allow them to take the moral high ground. And I also like your warning, um, saying we should not allow them to, uh, to take away our rights. Now, the, uh, our, our internet rights, our privacy rights, were taken from us under the guise of child pornography, terrorism, and, and the like. Um, uh, the government is protecting us from criminals by taking away our privacy. And you, I, I, I'm afraid that you have a very strong case that um, Bitcoin will be regulated to death if we're not careful. And my prediction is that if it is regulated to death, it will be done under the guise of, of fighting crime, probably fighting money laundering. Yeah. Um, so my question to you is, um, how can we stop them from regulating Bitcoin to death under the guise of fighting money laundering? Do we need to take back the moral high ground and say these money laundering laws were a, ba were a bad idea from the start? Uh, child pornography and terrorism is already illegal. We don't need to add money laundering laws on top of that. Or will that uh, uh, bring the risk that they will uh, identify us with money launderers and uh, it will backfire? 
It's a very good question, and uh, it would depend quite a bit on the audience and situation at hand. I don't have one specific answer that would fit all situations. You are right that child porn organized crime terrorism file sharing, that's one word that's being used to ram through anything that the government doesn't like at this point. Terrorism, fi terrorism file sharing, child porn organized crime, you could put them in any order, but those four are being used for anything that the, the government doesn't like at this point. The strong, how it, the, the strong point we have is that Bitcoin is a currency, and if you're arguing, as I pointed out earlier, that if you're arguing that this needs to be stopped because it can be used for illegal activity, then the obvious counterpoint is that, oh, then we need to stop the euro and the US dollar immediately. <laughs> because those currencies have always only been used to help starving children, right? So I don't have one single answer. You are entirely correct in your prediction on what will be used in or, uh, as attempts to take a moral high ground. And one obvious thing to tear that moral high ground down is that, but your currency is used for this already. Where, where do you come from? I'm sorry, I can't, I, I can't produce a one size fits all answer to that one. Okay. Um, what exactly would be uh, here uh, the big advantage of an economy, a world economy, may maybe with bitcoins against uh, the current situation? Or, for example, suppose the euro will be replaced by bitcoins. What would be the most, the biggest improvement? I don't think we know the biggest advantage yet, to be honest. But what is the we, reason uh, you want to promote? I, I sometimes say that bitcoin will do to banks what email did to the postal service. Bitcoin will do to banks what email did to the postal service. That's not my question. It's more like from an economic point of view, uh, why are you promoting the Bitcoin? Uh, what will be the, the end I'm, result? Right, I'm getting to that. And the point is, when we only had email on the web, we didn't know everything the web could do. We didn't know what the web would look like in 10 years. We didn't know how the web would be everywhere, how everybody could use the net without permission, how everybody could innovate. So we're just at the initial stages. What does it mean when anybody could set up a service and charge a hundredth of a cent on automatic from Nigeria or from Iran or from people who don't have access to today's finance today, today's, today's financial world? You're wrestling control of the money gears from a few players and putting them in the hands of the many. And I don't know what those many will come up with, but I do know that every time in history that has happened, we've made enormous progress. <laughs>